Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to the 1916 Company and How To, our series where we wind our way through the world of watches. Today, we discuss silicon as a component in watchmaking. So now, properly speaking, the first application of silicon componentry in a watch you could buy was the Ulysse Nardin Freak of 2001. Now, this is the Freak Out that came out many years later, but it uses the same application of silicon components in a double wheel escapement. The original watch, as originally marketed, had a double direct impulse escapement inspired by Breguet, with the tolerances achieved using the deep reactive ion etching technology that only silicon brings to the table. This watch continues in that tradition. You can see the twin wheels indexing the balance via an intermediate oscillator, the low oscillating mass and the precise tolerances enabled by the technology make this an ideal application, especially when you consider that the silicon component does not need to be lubricated. Now, the great thing about silicon in an escapement is that it allows for very precise profiling of the surfaces, and then it also, when you combine it with generally a synthetic diamond coating, it has very long wearing characteristics and low friction characteristics. This technology is not as restrictive as some of the others like hairsprings, which is why you'll find it across the industry from Breguet and Ulysse Nordin all the way down to Oris. Very common, very beneficial. You'll see this a lot. Now what you'll see less of is the use of silicon and hairsprings. A hairspring is more difficult, partly because the technology costs more money to develop, and it is rather restrictive by who has access to the patents. So the first experiments with silicon hairsprings were performed by both Ulysse Norden and Patek Philippe back in about 2002. Patek was doing it at the university level in Neuchâtel, and Ulysse Norden, through the Horological Museum of La Chaux de Fonds and its watchmaking lead, Ludwig Axlen, also experimenting with silicon hairsprings. Really only four organizations, the Swatch Group, Patek Philippe, Rolex, and then Ulysse Norden through its Sigatech subsidiary, they have access to this technology such that they can actually make it and use it for themselves rather than buying or licensing. Now this is a Tudor Black Bay Chronos, so it has access to that Rolex Group silicon technology. And although this is a Breitling B01 inside the Tudor Black Bay chronograph, the Breitling in a Tudor application gets the Tudor silicon hairspring. A lot of fine qualities. Again, if you oxidize it, it's gonna have a low thermal coefficient. And if you add a very precise profiling via sophisticated design on computers, you can actually get that to breathe concentrically like an overcoil, giving you the flat profile and thinness of a flat hairspring, but with the concentric breathing of an overcoil, anti-magnetic and thermally inert qualities. So that's silicon hairsprings, where you can achieve anti-magnetism, resistance to thermal drift, and also concentric breathing without an overcoil. If you wanna get even more sophisticated, then we start talking about compound components, such as balance wheels, where now you have the oscillator itself, primarily out of silicon, but this has been the rarest application launched by only a handful of companies, because not only does it have to be perfectly crafted, that is absolutely balanced all the way around, but it generally involves melding with another material, typically precious metals, whether platinum, or white gold, typically making an oscillator, a balance wheel, out of silicon requires you to combine components, which is more difficult to do. Examples would include several versions of the Debatoon balance wheel, as well as a balance wheel crafted by Ulysse Norden, especially on the Freak models, and Gyromax SI by Patek Philippe. But certainly within the scope of silicon assortment components, that's the anchor, the escape wheel, the hairspring, and the balance, the balance is the tougher one to create. Okay, now we're going absolutely ballistic and we're using silicon as a different kind of escapement, a constant force escapement. To date, two companies have done this at scale. One was Gerard Perigo, whose constant escapement LM, by many from the Senfine technology at Valcher Manufacture to Debatoon's Resonique, which is an ongoing R&D project. The reason I call this Frontier is because although it has incredible potential, it hasn't exactly worked in practice. In 2017, Zenith announced the DeFi Lab, a watch that replaced over 30 parts 
of the traditional mechanical movement with a single monoblock oscillator. It was the escapement, it was the balance, it was the entire mechanism, and it operated at over 100,000 vibrations per hour, but with incredibly low amplitude, whereas a standard watch in good shape should run 300 degrees of amplitude, this system ran more like 16 to 20. As a result, despite the high frequency, you could also get an admirable power reserve, and the claims initially were stunning. Quartz-like accuracy, less than one-third of a second gained per day, and they backed it up by bringing it to market as the DeFi inventor in 2019, and almost immediately there were issues. The watch was claimed as a chronometer, none of them were running to chronometer spec, the watch went back, changes were made, it still wasn't running as advertised in many cases. It was functional, but not to a chronometer level. First, Zenith stopped advertising it as a chronometer. Second, Zenith just stopped making it. So at least one major reversal for a brand that had all the resources in the world. The surprise, perhaps, was that the follow-up and the more successful implementation came from Frédéric Constant, a Swiss brand owned by a Japanese company founded by two Dutch founders. And working with a Dutch company that was specialist in silicon, they created the Manufacture Monolithic series, and they've been plugging away at it. As of the fall of 2023, they had been through nine different oscillators, which means, like Zenith, they found this needs a lot of revision on the fly. And so far, the claims have not been meteoric. Now, in terms of how silicon is made, and this is very important, it is highly automated. There are a lot of questions about whether this is appropriate as the future of luxury horology. We tend to think of things like hand craftsmanship, tradition, savoir-faire passed down through generations, and fine decoration as the cornerstones of what make luxury mechanical watches so appealing. And with silicon, we really lose a lot of that. Now, in the modern era, we've become very familiar with automation in the form of CNC for fairly large components, electrospark erosion for smaller ones, and then if you want to get really small, micron level tolerances, you need either LIGA, which is an additive process, a lithography for nickel phosphorus, or DRIE, which is deep reactive ion etching that allows you to etch a silicon wafer down to any size and shape of silicon component you want. The problems, this is all run by computers and performed by machines. And the final components, while very reliable and consistent, absolutely defy hand finishing. So we are at a crossroads. We have to ask as collectors, do we want our luxury watches to be both mechanical and quartz accurate or limited by technology, but traditionally beautiful? The choice is yours. And that is how to understand silicon in watches. <laughs>